You can always tell a Toastmaster because they clap for everything, for everybody, no matter what they say or do. We clap a lot. We like to appreciate people getting out. Toastmasters, how many here know or have been to a Toastmasters meeting? I know there's some folks that have been members. Toastmasters has absolutely nothing to do with making a toast with alcohol, water, or anything else. Toastmasters is a Personal Development Club, the byline for Toastmasters is where leaders are made. So it's not just about public speaking, public speaking is a part of it. The Toastmasters meets the second and the fourth Monday of every month at the main library. Some Toastmasters Club meet more often, but it's an opportunity to learn leadership. It's an opportunity to learn how to speak on your feet. Sometimes when you're trying to express something, like politicians have to do, you want to be able to think quickly, to come up with a topic, and to be able to learn how to express yourself in a way that other people might take the time to listen to you. It's an opportunity for leadership. As Anne mentioned, Caitlin's our president's first year to her being president. So she's learning how to be a leader in that capacity. Speak because there are different project speeches that we do. You're also evaluated on those speeches. You learn how to do things a little bit better. We have another part of the program that's called Table Topics. But that is an opportunity to think on your feet, where someone is assigned to be the topics master. They come up with topics, and then for one to two minutes, you get to think on your feet about a, and talk about a topic that you may not have known anything about or that you want to present. So it allows you to get your thoughts organized to think quickly, because as you know, a lot of times we are speaking in public, or we're speaking to a group, and we need to be able to think on our feet. Did I miss anything exciting about Toastmasters? Thank you, Victor, for that wonderful introduction. What I would like to add is that not only do we work on speaking, speaking skills in our speech, but we also work on fluidity of our 
our speech, as well as not having any ahs or ums or filler words in our speaking. <laughs> I am Stacy, Patrick, Ann, Serena, Burn, Chris, Mason, Sarah, Talia, Tasia, Skip, Naeem, Carter, Caleb, Olivia, Chris, Micah, Shan Shan Shu, Kelton, Jennifer, Carter, Tom, Wendell, Grizz, Chris, Patty. I am a bartender. I am a university professor. Doctor of veterinary medicine. I am a medical technologist. I'm an army veteran. Doctor. Writer. A retired school teacher. Graphic designer. Lawyer. Saleswoman. Self-employed. Project manager. Life insurance. Lifeguard. Stay-at-home mom and a college student. Archaeologist and writer. Contractor. Crazy aunt. A professor. Museum curator. Program specialist. Retired medical educator. A buyer. Pilot. Web designer. Troubadour. Volunteer coordinator. Homeschool student. Social worker. I'm an American. I am a dog person. Vegetarian. Breast cancer survivor. Husband and parent. A mother. We are, we are a family. family. A mom. I am a woman. Single and straight. Husband and a father. Straight and a mother. A high school senior. Middle Eastern and an animal lover. Straight, single, pet owner. Gay. And now we have, uh, okay, is it, is it good, good and put, clear? Or do you have a lot of noise back there? I think he's still working. Yes. Four score and seven years ago, our father brought forth. How's it coming? Is it good? Or do you need me back there? Okay, cool. Uh, we will be beginning in about two minutes. Is that, uh, what's the countdown say there? Uh, one minute, 30 seconds. One minute, how many seconds? 30. How many now? <laughs> never mind, never mind. In, in the meantime, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, everybody who's here, how the system is working today. We have several microphones. Of we are uh, we are really pleased to utilize the UUC UU Church facilities here. Get up here if I'm in the shot, anyway. Uh, and Jerry back here has helped us tremendously with the AV system, which is going to be the the uh, PowerPoint is going to be up here on the screen. I am an ally. I like to help people. Taking care of animals. Volunteer for community service. I like to help others in need. Help recovering alcoholics. Help non profit. Volunteer medical services. Showing people they are worthy of love. Rescue animals. Volunteer in my community. I am a former fundamentalist Christian. I am a natural. Free thinker and humanist. Free thinker. Former evangelical Christian. Preacher's daughter. I believe in God. Lifelong free thinker. Spiritual free thinker. I'm an atheist and a free thinker. Atheist. Secular human. Atheist and former. Jehovah's Witness. I am a Dudist. I am humanist and was raised Southern Baptist. I am an atheist. I am a way fallen Catholic. I am secular. I am secular. I am secular. We, we are secular. 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 What's the cow down there? Okay. Is this ready for a seat? You're all good. Ah. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers April Meetup. ASF is a nonprofit organization devoted to maintaining the separation between religion and state, advocating a scientific and humanistic viewpoint, and improving the lives of non-believers. Maybe without their knowledge, the believers. You can learn more about ASF by picking up one of the flyers available at the back table or on the web at arfreethinkers.org or the most reliable way by getting to know the members and organizers around you.
societal progress, and truthful communication. Um, oh, I forgot to say who I am. I'm Laura Noah, uh, and I have uh, just started working with the board and have enjoyed meeting all of you wonderful people. Um, that said, next we have Laura Noah, who will present our free thought of the day. Please give her a warm welcome. Maybe. Oh, thank you so much. It's so warm. Um, so today's pre-thought of the day is about a woman I just learned about uh, who was born in 1810. And I'm just really disappointed that I didn't know anything about her until today. Um, her name is Ernestine Rose. Um, here are some things that she is credited to having said or written. Emancipation from every kind of bondage is my principle. I go for the recognition of human rights without distinction of sect, party, sex, or color. That was at a speech in 1853. Uh, ignorance is the evil. Knowledge will be the remedy. Knowledge not of what sort of beings we shall be hereafter or what is beyond the skies, but a knowledge pertaining to terra firma, and we may have all the power, goodness, and love that we have been taught belongs to God himself. So that 1845. We should work to get rid of irrational laws based on sectarian opinions and to replace them by laws standing upon rational knowledge. Novel idea, right? <laughs> she had an 1845. We ask only the right to investigate everything, to throw it free and open and to see if after examination, we can arrive at something we can say we know. And then, humanity, morality, and justice to man and woman, and non-interference with each person's private opinions, for these ends we must work. We belong to the same human family, and we must work for it. Our life is short, and we cannot spare an hour from the human race, even for all the gods in creation. She said that in 1878. So turn of the century, barely. Um, these important thoughts were proclaimed between 1845 and 1878 by Polish-born atheist, abolitionist, and pioneering advocate of women's rights, Ernestine Rose, who combined a forthright rejection of religion with a passionate devotion to social reform. Rose had a forcible voice. which she had shared, the slave she had helped set free from the bondage of ownership, and the slave from the bondage of authority. She was cheered and exclaimed, but I have lived. Uh, that was, I guess, a friend of hers named George Holyoke. The pioneering activist and social reformer Susan B. Anthony felt that Rose was too ahead of her time to be truly appreciated in it, noting in 1854, Mrs. Rose is not appreciated, nor cannot be by this age. She is too much in advance of the extreme ultrists even to be understood by them. Nevertheless, Rose's fierce advocacy of rationalism and humane social reform helped pave the way for generations of humanist women who came after her. So I hope you will give her a Google and read a little bit more about her. I certainly plan to. Um, that being said, uh, we have Jerry Schultz uh, to do our skeptical sidebar today. Misinformation and pseudoscience are everywhere. Our misinformation of the day features, feature helps us develop the critical thinking skills we need to exist in the modern world without being duped. Please give a round of applause to Jerry Schultz, who will be giving us our skeptical sidebar.
What harm is there in silly superstitions? Well, I used to read tarot cards. Here's a bag of the cards I collected when I was doing that. <laughs> <coughs> Did I believe that I could really commute the basis of hidden meanings of a deck of cards? No, of course not. I had no idea what the traditional meanings of the cards were even supposed to be. I didn't care. I could do readings from a deck of Mother Goose cards. But instead, I relied on the mystical, psychic, and predictive power of a method called cold reading. I practiced well, cold, well-worn cold reading techniques, and the cards really are just a distraction. If you haven't heard of cold reading, it's pretty good at them. My readings, as always, as the advertisements used to say, were for entertainment purposes only. Then one time, a relative came in from out of town. While she was here, <laughs> You must be sure to wear shoes when you leave the house next Thursday. <laughs> there's, there's something in the back of your refrigerator. It's beginning to smell. Don't eat it. It, it, it was fun. Then a few years later, I don't really remember if it was a few months or a few years later, but anyway, they, they were coming back again, and she called to say that, and she said, while she's here, she definitely needed me to do another tarot reading for her. You were right about everything. <laughs> Okay, I have no recollection of what I'd actually told her, but I was pretty sure I wasn't right about everything. I told her, look, it's just for fun. It's nonsense. She said, I said, I know you. After we got off the phone, I realized that I really convinced her, even though I really hadn't even tried to. She should have known that psychic powers are baloney. She certainly should have known that if anyone in the world had contacts in the spirit world, it wasn't me. <laughs> But I was kind of unsettled by the experience and you know, thought about it, and I realized that if someone took me seriously, someone who knew me took me seriously, as she had, I would be able to give some spectacularly bad advice and perhaps do some real harm. So I quit. I put all these tarot cards away in this bag and you know, left them there until fairly recently when I decided to talk about this. It's been years since I played this game. I don't know if I could even do it now if I wanted to, although I can still recognize it once I see someone else doing cold reading and using those techniques. But I'm worried. Harmless fun may not be quite so harmless after all. It told me the truth of something I once heard through some mystical waves in the air, the radio. If you believe in things that you don't understand, then you suck. So be careful. Thank you. Next on the agenda, thank you, Jerry. Uh, next on the agenda, we have our member story. This can be a story of how you became a free thinker, or how you were discriminated against, or how you learned something new, something inspiring, or anything, really. And I would like to bring to the podium Wanda. She's going to do our story today. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. For those who may not know me, I am Wanda Jo Huddleston Lindsley, and I am Stardust. I am part of everything that has ever been or will ever be. I started the journey on this 1349, what would be the exact day, but in, I was born in Detroit. I grew up in the South in about four and a half miles from Camden, Arkansas. I went to a little country school, rode a bus school, unless you had all day to get there. I went to Cumberland Presbyterian Church every Sunday. And when I was in the 11th grade, I got into a discussion with our minister. I asked him, oh, not believe in God. I mean, who do they think created the universe? And my minister said, given that theory, who created God? <laughs> <laughs> I turned and walked home. He blew my mind. That summer I had the opportunity to attend a uh, participate in a National Science Foundation program, and I attended the uh, 
for like six weeks, I went to a church every Sunday, a different one, trying to figure out where was I as far as my understanding of the universe. And some of them were going like, we are the only way to get to heaven. If you don't believe in us, you're going to hell. And some of them were, love your neighbor as yourself. Be kind to people. Mixed message, kind of. <laughs> anyway, this whole idea that there was one powerful being that had control over everything. And I went, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that's right. You know, we've since learned that there are thousands of, of galaxies all over the place. When I was growing up, there was the Milky Way, pretty much, as far as we knew. So, I'm an agnostic. I don't know if there's one powerful being, and I don't care. <laughs> Thank you, Wanda. Um, our monthly meetups offer you the chance to have your voice heard. Talk to us if you would like to deliver the free thought of the day or the skeptical sidebar or the member story. You have something to share and we are here to empower you. Um, our speaker for today is Dr. Stephen Barger. Steve's a native of Searcy, Arkansas and graduated from Hendricks College in Conway and then obtained a PhD in cell biology at Vanderbilt University. After a doctoral fellowship at the University of Kentucky, he became the first recipient of the Inglewood Fellowship for Alzheimer's Research at UAMS, where he is also a member of the Arkansas General Assembly's Alzheimer's Disease Advisory Board. Steve has published over 100 articles in the field of neuroscience and neurological disease and has been cont nearly continuously funded by grants from the National Institutes of Health and president of that society's Arkansas chapter. He received the Odyssey Medal for Research from Hendricks College in 2010, and he's also an instructor and research advisor for grad students, including serving as course director for a course named The Basic Biology of Aging. Stephen is an outdoors enthusiast and enjoys competition in a variety of endurance events, including triathlons and adventure racing. Me too. Have we not found each other? <laughs> um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Barber. So glad you're not constrained by any religious strictures against lying. I want to thank Ann especially for inviting me. And Chris uh, has also uh, been instrumental in, in trying to get me here. I've, I've wanted to come to this meeting for several months. Um, and we finally got a, a speaker that would, was attractive to me. So, you know, <laughs> come, so. Um, no, seriously, I've, I've been involved in some other Freethinker events. Some of you may have seen me at Pint Night a few times, but I, I confess that I've, I've lapsed a little bit in the last uh, year or so. I guess we all did during COVID, right? So I uh, hope, hope to get back into active participation. I'm going to talk to you today about Alzheimer's disease, uh, some about what it really is, and kind of describe the condition and what we understand about its science. Um, talk a little bit about current treatments, and then get into a little bit of our research and tell you where we hope uh, treatment's going to go in the future. This is our lovely building here that started out as uh, just a four-story building. We added four more floors uh, about seven or eight years ago, I guess. You can see, this is taken from the VA. You can see downtown Little Rock in, in the distance. Um, so people often confuse Alzheimer's with dementia. Just kind of want to draw a little bit of a contrast here. Dementia is a symptom of Alzheimer's disease, but there are other causes, and we'll get into that in a second. But what really is dementia? The thing that we see most commonly is a, a loss of short-term memory, 
um, especially in Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia. Um, that's something that, that crops up first. Eventually, there's more kind of generalized confusion, including spatial disorientation. People get lost a lot. Um, sometimes you see people exhibit some inappropriate behavior. They, they sort of lose their frontal lobe control of, of what's uh, appropriate to, to do in public. Um, eventually, it progresses in most of these conditions to something where you, you lose some really basic uh, fundamental neurological functions, like even the ability to swallow them well. So a lot of Alzheimer's disease uh, patients their lungs. Uh, Alzheimer's, I mentioned, is the most common. Uh, just uh, heard a, a tragic case of Lewy body disease here among our, our fellowship uh, here. Uh, that's a, a pretty rare, at least in most communities, a pretty rare form of dementia. It tends to involve a lot more hallucination. It's, it has some overlap with Parkinson's disease, so these people often have a motor tremor as well. Uh, I want to get into the distinctions between Alzheimer's and vascular disease a little bit more in more really expensive, so very few people get them. So unless you do an autopsy, it's really difficult to say whether it's really Alzheimer's disease or not. Some really well-trained psychologists can discriminate that with about, mm, probably the best ones around 90% accuracy, but there's some, some, uh, some fudgeability there, and, and vascular disease tends to kind of mimic Alzheimer's a lot. And so we'll get into why that's important in a moment. Um, B12 deficiencies and other kinds of dietary problems can cause dementia. One of, the re one of the best reasons for trying to get a good diagnosis is that some of these causes of dementia are reversible and are treatable, right? So that's clearly one. Um, adverse drug reactions also, sometimes drugs that are combined, what we call polypharmacy. Older people tend to have several different things wrong with them, so they might see one specialist for their knee and another specialist for their blood pressure. And, and people are prescribing different things that conflict sometimes. Um, clinical depression can create some, some memory loss, and so that's important to treat as well. Um, so what specifically really is Alzheimer's disease? It's progressive. We need to, we need to realize that. It's always going to get worse, and it ultimately ends in death if something else doesn't kill you first. Um, it begins in the memory centers, what we, the region we call the hippocampus is really affected early, and that's an area that's really critical for forming memories, probably for retrieving them as well. Um, physically, we have to diagnose this really only at autopsy, unless, as I say, you can get a PET scan. So I want to tell you just a little bit about where we are with treatment. Um, until just the last couple of years, you folks might have heard the, the big discussion and controversy about um, a drug uh, called aducanumab or aduhelm from Biogen um, that's hit the market here in the last few years. Uh, but until that, the only drugs we had really just treated symptoms. And they're honestly, frankly, they're really just stimulants. Um, they act almost the same as, as caffeine, uh, not in the same mechanism of action, but they kind of just boost function a little bit. In fact, when I was in grad school, I knew some med students who took it before tests. Just, you know, so, so these drugs, um, Exelon is one that you've probably heard of. Um, uh, working on some of the trade names, but um, in the brain, in the brain, which is just kind of a, kind of turns up the game on everything that you're doing cognitively. So these two new treatments are based on a process called passive immunization. Uh, it's really kind of similar to what you would get for a snake bite. A lot of people don't realize this, but if you're, if you're treated traditionally, um, Injecting you with um, antibodies, which is part of your immune system reaction, right? Uh, that, that have been generated in some other context, and those antibodies act as your own would if you were producing them. And that's kind of what we're doing here with Alzheimer's disease in the last few couple of years. <clears throat> Here's an MRI that can show you um, a really clear distinction between a normal brain and an Alzheimer's brain. This black space here within the skull is all just fluid-filled space where brain tissue's been lost. What you're losing mostly is gray matter. 
Uh, this deeper tracks here that are lighter color, that's the white matter. Those are long fibers that connect different parts of the brain to one another. You're really losing the, the more functional part of the brain where the synapses are. And you can even see that on gross examination when you take the brain out to just shrinkage, particularly in what we call the gyri. So these, these grooves become bigger and more spacious because you've lost tissue between them. This is something I hope to have time to get into. Um, what we see early on in Alzheimer's disease is a loss in glucose utilization. And this is one of the PET scans. This is not the most definitive scan, but um, PET scans for glucose utilization can, can clearly show some uh, tendency toward dementia, not necessarily Alzheimer's. What we're looking at here is a rate of use of glucose in the brain, and the hotter, brighter colors are the more intense uh, areas of, of, uh, of glucose utilization. You can see in this Alzheimer's brain, uh, they're just overall kind of cooling of the colors, which means less glucose being utilized. This is a slide from Alois Alzheimer himself, the guy who quote unquote discovered the disease. It was actually a, an, an African colleague that was working in his lab at the time that, that developed these stains and was the first one to see it. And handed it off to, to Dr. Alzheimer and said, what do you think of this? And, uh, and he, of course, stole the idea and published it under his own name. <laughs> no, no. Now, he, he had been seeing the patient, so it was his, under his direction that they examined the brain. Um, and so this is a, just a really simple kind of stain. It's a silver nitrate. Um, reaction center of this one. So it can show you these plaques are quite a bit larger than a single nerve cell. Um, and then the other pathology we see are these small fibers, really thin fibers you see here. These are inside the nerve cells. Those are called neurofibrillary tangles and they're comprised of a different protein. This protein, the protein that forms these plaques is primarily the beta amyloid peptide. So you hear amyloid quite a lot discussed in Alzheimer's disease. This is staining the amyloid plaque a little bit differently where we can see the cellular complexity. The red here is the amyloid, and some of these other wispy shapes here are other specific cell types that are involved. And I'll call your attention to the astrocytes, these brown cells kind of around the perimeter. These black cells in the center are an immune cell related kind of cell that's really trying to eat the plaque and chew it away and destroy it. And they actually do that pretty well through most of our lives. And for some reason, as we get older, they kind of lose that ability and the plaques start to, to accumulate. But these astrocytes are working at cross purposes. They're laying down a kind of glue around this thing that kind of prevents the microglia from, from working so well. Okay, so what are your risk factors for ultimate disease? Someone before we started was saying, I think that this is what people really want to know about how to avoid it. Um, don't get older. Die young. It's a pretty good, pretty good strategy. Um, there is an early onset form of disease. That was what Alzheimer himself described. The patient he saw was in the 40s. Um, it can occur as early as 27, uh, as early as case I recall here. Um, but most, most of these cases are much, much older. And that's what we call sporadic Alzheimer's disease. We don't understand the reason or cause for why it cropped up. Uh, but there is some association with family history, so um, even for those cases in older people, it's a little bit more common if your family has a history of it. It looks like head trauma probably can help see it, and this is particularly head trauma later in life. If you fell off the swing when you were you know, seven, probably don't worry about it, even a car crash at 25. But if you lose consciousness in a, from a head trauma up in your 50s, 60s, um, it's a little bit more likely to, to participate in an increased risk. Down syndrome, a lot of people don't realize this, but every single individual who has complete trisomy for chromosome 21 will get Alzheimer's disease if they live to, say, 45 or so. And you might say, well, how do you distinguish that? I mean, they have some cognitive compromise already, right? But it's a little bit different. Um, very often, people with Down syndrome are a little bit slower to learn things, but once they learn them, they retain them. And then eventually, you know, if they get Alzheimer's, they start losing that, that memory retention. And we can talk about why that is. We, we actually know why it is. Um, strokes tend to increase the risk, especially uh, a lot of TIAs. So you, these big strokes are sometimes so catastrophic that they create an, an issue that takes a person's health down so fast that they don't get Alzheimer's. But a lot of little baby strokes happening over time seems to, to increase one's risk. 
We're going to talk a bit about lifestyle modification and, and those sorts of things, exercise, diet, definitely contribute to overall dementia cases. We're not really sure that it's really Alzheimer's per se that's being modified by diet and exercise. Okay, the genetics. Um, we have these genes that really cause Alzheimer's disease, and then we have some genes that really just raise your risk. So that's true with anything, right? Like, you know, you have the genes affect everything. But there are three genes that will definitely cause Alzheimer's if you have mutations in those genes. These are the cases we call familial, even though there's a little bit of a family association with all cases. Um, familial means autosomal dominant inheritance. That means if your parent had it, you have a 50-50 chance of getting the gene. If you get the gene, you've got a, like a 98% chance of getting the disease, provided that you live long enough. Which doesn't have to be that long. Uh, for these cases, some of these, majority of these people get the disease before the age of 65. And again, these, these late onset cases tend to be what we call sporadic. It's important to understand the statistics here, those familial genetic cases that are from a causal genes, but only about 5% of all cases. And there's an interesting distinction here that we, we use this sink analogy kind of to describe this. Um, the water level in the sink is a function of two things, right? It's the rate at which the water is coming into the sink, and it's also the rate at which the water is draining out. And so you can get the sink level up or down through changing either of those. What we think is that with familial Alzheimer's disease, these genetic cases, we're producing more of the beta amyloid peptide too fast because of these mutations. And it looks like in the sporadic cases, something's happening to us as we get older that reduces the rate at which we're clearing this peptide out. It's kind of an unusual peptide in that a lot of our body's typical mechanisms for removing proteins and other damage spent, you know, old molecules don't work real well on this peptide. And so a big component of how we get rid of it is export. We're actually pumping it out of the brain into the bloodstream and then your kidneys grab it and you're peeing this peptide out your whole life. Well, we used to think it was an abnormal peptide that only showed up in people with Alzheimer's disease. And a, a friend of mine, actually, um, <laughs> he described it as, as uh, collecting a swimming pool's worth of cerebral spinal fluid to be able to find that it was actually a normal thing, a normal cerebral spinal fluid. Now we have much more sensitive techniques for seeing it. Um, it's, we now know that everybody makes it, and, and it's, it's actually healthy to have it. And we actually look for incipient Alzheimer's disease by seeing a decline of that peptide in your bloodstream or CSF. Because if it's declining there, we know it's getting stuck up in the brain. Okay, so what are these causal genes? Um, the first one discovered is APP. That stands for amyloid precursor protein. It's actually the protein. And uh, let's get into that one just a little bit more closely here. This is a kind of a cartoon version of what this protein looks like. For those of you who might have a little bit of biology or biochemical experience, you might be accustomed to seeing proteins shown this way. They're, this is not how they're shaped, of course. They have these complex, they fold up into complex shapes. But they're made in a linear sequence. They are really just a rope or, I guess, more appropriately, beads on the string. But, you know, it's sometimes useful for us in thinking about how they're, they're regulated to think of them in this linear structure. This white area here is to indicate the cell membrane. So in the outside of the cell, you have this kind of wall that separates the cell from everything outside it. This protein is sticking through that membrane. And the amyloid sequence is partly in that position that's sticking through the memory in there. And so you have two clips, two, two cuts in this protein by what's called the beta and the gamma secretase. So beta cuts here, gamma cuts here, and it liberates this beta amyloid peptide, a short, approximately 40 amino acid piece of this protein. Um, but then there's also this alpha secretase processing that can cut right in the middle of it. If that happens, you can't possibly produce the cut that, that, uh, that cuts this protein. This is a, just another depiction of, again, you see the amyloid uh, sequence here. And this is just to show you where the mutations occur that cause disease. 
mutations are outside of the sequence of the amyloid itself, which is interesting. So we think what they're doing is increasing the rate at which enzymes cut the protein. So the first one discovered uh, was actually a two amino acid change out here just outside the front end of the peptide, and that makes it a little bit more attractive to this secretase or this enzyme called beta secretase that makes that cut. The other is down here, um, have interesting names like Indiana, London, Swedish, uh, this one's a Swedish one up here. Uh, these all derive from the fam where the families live where these mutations were found. Um, but these are just outside the back end of the peptide and they have an interesting effect on the processing of the, of the protein. But essentially, these things tend to create longer beta amyloids. So this would be, I think, what's that thing say? 38? I think amino acids, yeah, 38 amino acids here. 39 is a pretty common link. So there's a little bit of variability in where this, this back end of it stops. Um, and it's these longer forms that are 42 and 43 amino acids long that are really associated with the development of dementia. And the reason is because it's just stickier back there. Those, those amino acids are ones that kind of tend to stick together better. And so that makes this peptide form aggregates, multiples of itself, kind of stuck together in these plaques. So, well, you know, we, we understand this enzyme cuts here. Let's just block that enzyme. And it turns out that that's a bad idea. Also cuts all these other proteases. And so there are side effects associated, of course, with trying to change biology that extensively. Um, so we'll go on now and talk about these other genes. These were discovered a little bit after the APP. Uh, Presenilins 1 and 2 are on two different down here. And what happens actually is that the mutations decrease the rate at which those enzymes chew this peptide shorter and shorter. So. The mutation is compromising the function of the enzyme, and it's just making it fall off of its target a little too soon, and so we're not getting the peptide as short as it should be. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these other genes. Uh, APOE is the big one. You may have heard of this. Um, you can get genotype for this. It's kind of recommended that you don't. Um, 20, 23andMe kind of got in some trouble because they were telling people their APOE status back when they first came out, and this is actually violates uh, FDA policy against providing. Um, it's not as nearly as 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 uh, definite a, a genotyping result as those mutations in APP and presenilin. But what's interesting about the APOE genetic differences is that they're really common. These are not, we don't really even call these mutations. We call them polymorphisms because they're pretty common in the population. About 16, 17% of us have the epsilon-4 allele, or, or flavor of APOE, which is what predisposes to Alzheimer's disease. This is another way of looking at the linear sequence of a protein. So these are just like lines. We've got on the top here is the more common APOE3 variant. It picks up again here in amino acid 61 through 120, 121 picks up here. So this is again just the linear sequence kind of snaking across the screen here. And I'm showing you this just to show you the difference between APOE3 versus APOE4. This is the one associated with higher rates of Alzheimer's. It's a single nucleotide, nucleotide change, a single change in your, in your DNA called cysteine to an arginine. Seems pretty subtle. If you're a biochemist, you can understand the differences between these amino acids and what they might do, but, but it's, it's just one tiny change in this protein. You have two, gene, two copies of most genes. Uh, most of our genes are what we call autosomal. If they're not on the sex chromosomes, like X and Y, well, you've got two copies. And if you have one copy of three and one copy of four, you're three times more likely to get Alzheimer's disease than somebody who's 3-3. Three, three. Okay. Everyone here is Caucasian, it seems to be. Uh, that's, that's true. It's a little bit less of a risk factor for some other minority groups. If you have two copies of four, it's possible that you can have this arginine position here in, in the gene from both of your, of your chromosomes. Um, 
you're 15 times more likely to get autism. Now, this is just astronomical as odds ratios go. That's, that's almost a guarantee um, if you live to be 70. Genes have been uh, discovered since then. A lot of them involve the immune system, particularly inflammation in the immune system, and so that's really intriguing. Um, Trim2, PCOM, CD33, these are all involved in the immune system function, so uh, that's, that's giving us a clue to, to what might be going on. I mentioned these immunizations for trying active immunizations, so actually giving someone a vaccination against the beta amyloid peptide uh, years ago, and that kind of halfway worked. We'll, we'll look at that. Um, we're trying to, to look at some of these enzymes that change the, the processing, those that clip the protein and liberate the, am the amyloid. Now, I told you we can't really inhibit beta secretase completely. But gamma secretase, it looks like we might be able to boost its activity and, and have it stick on the peptide and chew it up a little bit better. So people are, are still working on that. Some detergent-like molecules that can get into these amyloid sequences and kind of prevent them from sticking together and, and clumps so well. We call those plaque busters. Uh, function and inflammation, we're trying some anti-inflammatory strategies. And then things that just generally boost the survival and robustness of neurons. Um, there's some things that just kind of make neurons healthier, like antioxidants and, and stuff. So those are, these are kind of organization. I think those are most of you are kind of familiar with that. We talked about it a lot during the COVID crisis, but that's where you inject something into a person, or in this case an animal, um, that you don't want to have around. Now, a virus might be one of those things. You can break a virus down and inject parts of it. You elicit immune response against that and generate antibodies that grab it, bind it up, prevent it from working. Somebody got the idea that if you just bind up this amyloid peptide, then it can't clump together. And it worked beautifully in mice. Um, and so we were really excited back around 1998, 99. Um, and we'll look at some pictures of what it did there in the mice. But it creates um, that sort of autoimmune attack against the brain. Um, and some of us at the time said, well, 5%, you know, that's really not such bad odds. A 100% chance of dying with the disease if you don't treat it. Um, but, of course, you know, you'd like to have something safer. And so people reason, well, if we, if we control the antibodies, we generate it somewhere else, maybe in, a, in an incubator where we can produce this stuff and then inject a known amount, stop it when we need to, uh, dose it properly, then maybe that's a bit better time. So here we're actually injecting the antibodies instead of the antibody. There's no real involvement of the immune system risk for this side effect called aria. It's a little bit of a, of a too mild sounding name. I guess it's sort of a, a euphemism. Amyloid related imaging abnormality. And it sounds pretty, pretty innocuous. Oh, it just shows up something weird on the MRI. Uh, it's actually uh, an edema. It's actually swelling. It's some fluid leaking out of the blood vessels in the brain and creating swelling. And it can be quite serious. In fact, even fatal occasionally. Um, it's, uh, again, a pretty small fraction of people, somewhere under 5% now that's getting this. Um, and none of them are pro progressing to have as, as many negative outcomes as they did with the, uh, with the active in, in mice. Years ago, this is 1999, this paper came out. So, so these are, this is the hippocampus, kind of a very typical structure, shape of the hippocampus that we see. It has this kind of interesting kind of coil. Does anybody understand what hippocampus is? And, because uh, it, it looks a bit like a seed. Um, but these plaques, this, this dirty brown stuff here are the plaques. And here's a mouse that was immunized, and you can see just clean as a whistle, no plaques at all. Um, and that happened in some of the people as well. Like here's one, here's a couple. Once these people died, um, you know, investigators took their brains, stopped them up, looked. Well, the plaques were really reduced a lot. So this is a person who's never immunized. So that's, you can see the plaque never really generated antibodies against the amyloid. So you can see it didn't really remove it very well. But some of these other people had pretty good removal. Um, no improvement in their cognitive ability at all. No, no abatement of their dementia. And you might, you know, a lot of the trial, they skipped the phase one safety trials. They said, look, this is so important. We just, we have to find out if this is going to work. Uh, it looks so promising in mice that they just, 
they do something really unusual, have much more loss of life <coughs> if something goes wrong, right? So these were advanced cases. Um, so that was run by a company called Elon at the time. This was um, in 2001. They did these phase 2A or 2-3 uh, trials. I mentioned that meningoencephalitis that occurred uh, 5 or 6% of patients. No major cognitive improvements. More recently, now we've gone to these passive uh, attempts, and these are all different trials. Sometimes they were actually starting a little bit earlier um, because this seemed safer. They thought, okay, we can use younger people and people earlier in the disease stage and not worry so much about uh, side long. Um, it, it came out of this Diane um, initiative. And I, I want to point this out really. I mean, there's too much to read here. But the thing to point out is it's a public-private partnership. The National Institutes of Health partnered with some companies. And this has been a, a, a really kind of a growing trend at NIH. Uh, to try to, to make these public-private par partnerships and, and boost not only big, long-standing, uh, big pharma companies like Roche and Eli Lilly, but also even some small biotech companies. Um, but anyway, the idea, you knew we were going to get the disease, so that's these genetic cases that I talked about earlier. The familial cases, about 5% of people. A huge number of these were discovered initially in South America and Venezuela for the trial that's going on. And the rationale is there, well, you know, you know you're going to get disease, so, you know, it probably seems like less of a, of a danger to try, to try to intervene because you're at high risk anyway. And because we know you're going to get it, we can start early. You don't have to go out among the population and say, well, let's find that 40% of people that might get Alzheimer's when they're 80 <laughs> and start treating them when they're 40. You know, that's just... The statistics are, are really difficult, and there's this risk of adverse events starting that young, treating someone that long. But with these cases, maybe you could start 15, 20 years before the disease and intervene and, and make a difference. And so they did, and, and they found a difference with this one new drug called aducanumab uh, in the lab. When they marketed it, the trademark is aduhelm. Um, really interesting process here. This thing, uh, they skipped phase two again. Alzheimer's is so important, let's just try to get this thing tested. Jumped into phase three and it looked futile. The initial analysis said this is not working. So they, they closed the trial and um, gave up on it just like they had all those others before. And then, lo and behold, six months later, for some reason, some statistician comes in and says, well, you know, if we take some of these cases out, and look at the other ones. We look at the ones where it worked. <laughs> it looks like it worked. And, and I want to point out that um, the, the review panel that are not FDA employed scientists, these are people like me that they incorporate to come sit on a panel and give them advice. Every single member of that panel said, no, this is hinky, this is bad stats, you don't, this is not how you do things. Um, but the FDA, in your wisdom, somehow the, the, the career administrators said, no, we need something to work for Alzheimer's. Let's give some, some people some hope by pretending that this works. <laughs> and so they approved it. It, it created um, you know, some, some big outcry, congressional committees met to talk about it. Um, and then there was, they, you know, once they got some pushback category, um, big health providers, insurance companies, and clinics, like Clinical Clinic, clinic um, said, we're not going to do this. This is not real. It's not good science. Um, Medicare refused to pay for it unless it was people really in a trial that were being watched. Uh, again, from part of the pushback, budget <laughs> lowered their price. It was $56,000 a year initially. We cut that in half. Um, Many private insurers have, have refused to pay. Um, we don't know really. So it's the way this was approved was as sort of a quasi approval trial, so that anybody that's being treated, they have to continue to track them and monitor their cognitions and see if it's really helping them or not. And there's a chance with, with any kind of medic, if you help 10% of patients, 
and you incorporate everybody in the statistics, it kind of washes out the effect. There may be something special about those 10% that some, for some reason this works for them. Um, so, you know, it's probably, the, the risk of, of side effects is pretty low. If I had a, a family member, I would probably try it and just see, is this helping? Um, but we have a little bit more hope recently in a newer one called Lacanamab uh, that was just approved in January and the trade name for that is Lakemba. And it's showing uh, quite a bit more robust statistics. This is the statistic of the group of people that aren't treated. Uh, sorry, sorry, this is not treated. They're getting placebo. So this is the plaque count that they have in their brain. Uh, stays pretty, pretty steady. Uh, but in, with treatment, that comes down drastically. And that's been the case with a lot of these. And both of these two graphs are showing cognition. So this is a person, this is people, population people on placebo, showing their, their kind of constant rate of decline of cognition on psychological tests of memory. And this is how much better, they're about 27% better uh, on the drug. And again, that might be, you know, 90% better for a few individuals. So, you know, again, it's worth trying. Um, but, but even with the whole population, this is not picking and choosing better than aducanum have. So, so a little bit more, more uh, <coughs> hope there. But I want to talk, and this could end up, you know, p perhaps ending 50 or 60 percent of cases. There are still quite a few people that get Alzheimer's disease with no ApoE4 allele, and this strategy is not going to help them. But it is a novel hypothesis, and, and um, we've gotten some pushback because it, frankly, I was opposed to it initially until this grad student just kept pushing it and pushing it. And I said, I'm going to do one experiment to show you that you're wrong. And you did it and it worked. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a good lesson in humility, and, and, uh, but also just really, we, we see here some modeling that, um, again, kind of shows you a shape of the protein. Again, it's a linear chain of things. and. Um, some of these chains sometimes wrap into twists that we call helices, they're, um, like this section here. And some of those helices sometimes can fold up and, and interact with each other, and we think this is the part that binds receptors on the surface of cells. Um, I did, oh, did I tell you the whole name? Apolipoprotein E. It's a lipoprotein. It actually forms part of your HDL um, that floats around your bloodstream. Uh, a little bit on the LDL, but mostly on HDL. It probably acts like the handle on the suitcase. It's got this big lipoprotein particle, and ApoE sitting on the side and allows receptors to grab the particle and pull it into cells. We think that has nothing to do with what it does in Alzheimer's. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. So, so there's some, uh, some variants that create risk for cardiovascular disease, heart disease, um, essentially. And the genetics of that doesn't follow Alzheimer's disease. We have this other variant called number two, which, so what is? Um, so again, I just want to point out this effect that, that the, the single amino acid change can have on the shape. Um, this arm kind of tends to hang off farther on the A3. Uh, when it's bound to a lipoprotein particle, it's probably more in this horseshoe kind of shape, kind of wrapped around the particle. Um, again, you can kind of see that handle right, that, um, that I pull it into cells. But what we found is that it binds DNA. And this was really, really surprising, um, a little bit disconcerting, because you don't often find proteins that do two things that are so different. We have really specialized little uh, what was it? well. They're not really enzymes, but we have specialized proteins that bind DNA and control hormones um, to various kinds of activity. Anything that changes the way your genes are used typically re relies on a protein binding to that gene and changing how actively the machines come in to make RNA off of that DNA. And then when you make that RNA, that's what makes the protein. So you can change the rate up and down as to how much of that you're making at any given time. 
And that's typically these protein, what we call transcription factors, factors that bind DNA and change the RNA transcription rate. This is the sequence of DNA. You're probably used to seeing, you remember the movie Gattaca, G-A-T-C-A, -A. those are the, the, uh, the, the letters that we use to represent the, the nucleotides in the DNA sequence. This is called a, a nucleotide motif um, projection. And what we're seeing here, the individual nucleotides are in your genome. There's a pretty good chance that this protein TFAB is going to bind it. When TFAB binds it, so what is TFAB? Well, TFAB is a factor that responds to protein clumping and starvation. So we have this, this mechanism in our cells called autophagy. And this serves two purpose, purposes. Um, you, you look in starvation conditions, autophagy start happens really kind of catastrophically in endurance athletes, people at a marathon, Around about 18, 19 miles, this process kicks in and starts pulling, eating their heart. <laughs> All their other muscles too, but also their heart. Because um, they're out of sugar energy at that point. Uh, it can also be triggered by clumps. And so the, one of the main way, things that this process exists for is to remove clumps of things, so like amyloid and neurofibrillary tangles. What it does is it, it, uh, it surrounds the clump with a membrane kind of builds this membrane structure around it, decorates that membrane with this protein called LC3, and LC3 pulls it to a lysosome, and a lysosome is just a little sack of degradative enzymes that will chew it up. So when you get it all chewed up, right? LC3 and a lot of the other enzymes in this process are turned on by this TFAB. This sequence that we call the clear side exists in the promoter elements of all of those genes required for autophagy. Okay, so what would happen if you had a protein come in and bind that sequence that was not a transcription factor? What if a protein bound that and covered it up and now TFAB can't get access and you reduce the expression of these genes, now you have clumps of things building up in your brain. And that's what ApoE4 is doing. So ApoE4 has a high affinity for that DNA sequence. It's binding there and blocking the TFAB. ApoE3 hardly ever binds. It binds really weakly, but not much. And so TFAB can turn on these genes and you get LC3, you get P62, you get LAMP, all these proteins involved in autophagy. Uh, we showed that in Alzheimer's disease tissue. Uh, so these are these two groups of people on this, on this portion here have Alzheimer's disease. These people do not. If their genes are APOE3, this is the expression rates of those TFAB-controlled autophagy genes. If they have those, if you starve the cells, they kick up the expression of these autophagy genes if they are APOE3 cells. If they are APOE4 cells, they don't do as good a job of Pressing that. Protein clumps, you can see this here, this is a, a gel where you run the proteins through a, like a, I don't know, like a gel solution. And you can see some proteins clumping here in cells that are starved, those clumps go away. But if they're APOE4, the clumps don't go away, quantified that here. And this is some molecular modeling to kind of actually look at what the protein looks like on the DNA. You can see the double helix here. And these blue and red colors reflect different positions in the APOE protein bound to that DNA. This is just another way of looking at it. All of this documents from a predictive computational uh, way that the APOE4 is binding more tightly than the APOE3. And here we showed that biochemically by actually pulling the DNA down into the bottom of a tube and we found that the ApoE4 protein came along with it. The ApoE3 did not. This was the experiment that I tried to use to prove the grad student wrong. <laughs> didn't work. The exciting part. We have this guy on our team, uh, Sundaram Balasubramanian, an Indian chap who's a really, really good computational biologist. He's, he's the one who's modeled A. And he said, Steve, you know what? This green area right here that he's kind of highlighted, this is kind of a pocket 
that sits between the DNA here, job of binding a drug. You've got some charged residues there that can interact with some special you know, uh, positive and negative charges on the drug. If we arrange that in just the right shape, we get a drug in there, actually knock the DNA off the, the protein. Uh, some others, CBA1 and, and 3 we worked with, they, they could bind the pocket pretty well, but they didn't have quite as much ability it looked like in the computer to push it off the DNA. Well, we tested those in cells, and these are those autophagy genes coming back up as we increase the concentration of CBA2. So this is in a living uh, model, you know, a, a, a situation that has some high relevance. It's not just a computer-generated model anymore. It's now lives, living cells where we've changed the levels of these genes that are involved in clearing clumps out of cells, including the brain cells, just by adding this one drug. And so what we hope now is that we can get some drugs that will pharmaceutically change your genotype. It will convert a person who's APOE as if they were this you know, beneficial APOE3 um, type. The, the, the headache that you'll probably run into so far right now is that this one that works really well in the cells, we inject that in mice, and it works in the liver, but not in the brain. You've probably heard of the blood-brain barrier. This is a challenge to getting any kind of pharmaceutical agent into the brain. Um, it looks like this drug is not really good at crossing that barrier, so we're going to have to modify its structure a little bit. Take it out. What was that? Does the liver take it out? take it out? Uh, the good question. So, yeah, so you probably know that the liver processes a lot of the drugs that we take, um, especially those we take orally, goes into the, to the intestines. Once it hits the intestines, the first place the blood takes it to the liver. So if it's dangerous, the liver will get rid of it, right? Um, we don't know really what the level of processing is. The, the computational biologists tell us that it, probably would not be such a great substrate for P450 um, cytochrome uh, enzymes that, that, that do. But at any rate, we've got, you know, proof of principle that we can, can get something that will actually convert the activity of ApoE4 into something less, less harmful. So excited about that. My own work really, just in, in my own lab, um, is really a lot more committed to glucose delivery to the brain right now. I don't have time to go into all that today, but if anybody wants to stay longer, you know, we can talk about that. Um, we found some which is bona fide Alzheimer's disease from vascular dementia and these other causes of dementia that are associated. Some of the people involved here, uh, Sue Griffin discovered almost single-handedly the role of inflammation in Alzheimer's disease. She's now 89 years old, still coming to the lab every day. And so she knows how to do something right about aging. Um, she's, she's a wonderful joy to work around and has been a teacher and a mentor to all of us. Uh, these guys, Bob Reese and Srinivas Ayadavara, are working on this project with APOE. Um, Sundaram Balasubramaniam is the computational biologist um, who's working out the shapes. Peter Crooks is coming up with the drugs. He's actually, uh, was, he just stepped down as chair of the um, Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. And this is this uh, amazing, MD, he was actually an MD-PhD student, he's now a neurologist. Uh, so he's got a, a medical doctorate and a scientific doctorate, and he's combining those in his research. Paul Parkhan is his name, and he's the one that had this bright idea about APOE binding to DNA, and it, it, it was brilliant. It's, it's just amazing to see someone uh, come up with something like that at such an early stage in their career. And then this is a student that's worked with me, she's now a, uh, research professor at Washington University. She did a lot of the work with us on the glucose uh, story, but I didn't get a chance to tell you today. But that's what I've got to tell you today, and I'd be happy to take any kind of questions that you might have if we have time. Thank you so much, Steve. That was amazing. All right, does anybody have any questions? I'll come around with a mic. We got a question back here. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, Dementia is what killed my mother. Uh, I have an aunt that had, so those two, are, those two women are not blood related. My mother, up until a week or two before she died, would sing with my father. Uh, would sing songs that she obviously had heard, 
but not songs that they'd ever sung yet. My mother was not much of a singer. She'd stand up in church and sing. aunt was a big singer and will sit and sing with her daughter, my cousin, uh, for a long time. And I'm wondering why it is that people with advanced dementia still sing and still understand music. Yeah, it's cool. Um, I don't know, some of you might be fans of Oliver Sacks, this neurologist that wrote The Man Who Took His Wife for a Hat. He also wrote Awakenings about the development of, of El Dopa for Parkinson's. Uh, he's got a, a book called Musicophilia, where he talks about how it's just built to remember music. Um, in many cases, they're probably singing songs they learned a long time ago. And one thing we definitely see in Alzheimer's disease is that the memory loss kind of regresses. It starts with stuff you, you know, and that it's kind of like a little repeat relay that, that runs um, sensory um, stimuli come in, hit the hippocampus, and they, it, it, it's a circuit that, that keeps running that memory over and over and over, kicking it up into the cortex and kind of driving it, honing it in in the cortex and, and sticking it there. And so if you lose the hippocampus function, it's hard to form new memories, but you probably can still retrieve the ones that are burned into the cortex years ago. And so eventually Alzheimer's disease pathology starts to hit the cortex and parts of the brain where we you know, think these things are stored long term. So you do start to lose them eventually. But very often you'll see Alzheimer's patients who will remember people from a long time ago. Now those people have changed a lot in appearance, so they sometimes don't recognize them, and they often will confuse someone new in their life with those older people they remember. So their grandchildren they might mistake for their, their childhood playmates. Um, but they remember things from a long time ago, and, and you know, probably this, this music is a big part of that. But it should point out, too, that it, you know, that's a, an effective therapy um, that's really used a lot in homes now to, to help people just have help, healthier, more fulfilled lives even with dementia, you know, they can still participate in something and get along with others and have a social life and, you know, uh, again, just have some kind of fulfillment. Chris, did you have? Oh. So I know someone uh, whose great-grandmother, grandmother, father, in a direct line, uh, all had serious dementia, probably Alzheimer's. Is that someone who ought to get tested with genetic counseling? And then what does no, the genetic counseling we, do? We, we, have to, we have to let everyone you know, come to terms with this in their, in their own. Uh, there are other diseases like this where, you know, where we know the, the genetic cause. Um, Huntington's, Huntington's Korea is one of them. It's more tragic because it tends to be the younger, really profound, disabling motor disturbances. Um, so Woody Guthrie, for instance, had Huntington's Korea. You may have uh, heard about his flight. Um, at any rate, we, you know, we can, we, for a long time now, we've been able to test people for that. And there's a, you know, some fraction of people say, yeah, I want to know. And some people say, no, I, I don't want to be, I want to be blindsided. I don't want to see this is going to change the whole rest of my life, you know, dreading it. So you have to let people come to terms about whether they want to know that or not. Um, but what you're describing, you know, I would say the age of onset would tell you a little bit about Luke, right? It could just be that these are really sporadic cases that just, you know, if you, if you throw five match chicks on the ground enough times, they're going to land it, for which one could make a prediction. But then once you have a prediction, what do you do? You know, until we have a treatment that really works, people say there's not any good reason to know. Um, so what does genetic counseling accomplish? So genetic counseling just helps people understand the ramifications. In some cases, there are genetic diseases where there is a drug or some other kind of intervention we could do, you know, to, to lessen the effects or, or stave them off for a while. Um, and so you want to know that, but you also want people to understand the futility that's involved if there is such, you know, if, there's, if there is a condition where you can't do anything about it, you want people to know that before they make the decision, you know, to have this very depressing kind of thing in their lives. Um, so that's really what, where counseling comes into play, is to kind of help people get all the information they need to go make an informed decision about whether it's a good idea to, to know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we'll start. You were talking about uh, singing and uh, how uh, that kind of tends to, tends to continue. Uh, what about repetition? How, how does that play into it? Uh, well, anything that you repeat, you know, you tend to, to retain a little bit better um, as far as memory. Uh, you, are you talking about repetitious abnormalities like OCD? Or, or no, no, specifically insults and such. Yeah, so, you know, I think anybody probably has had this experience that, that you know, when you're trying to study for a test or learn something, you know, that you, that you want to do, you know, if you repeat it, it tends to get ingrained more strongly. Um, and that still is present in some Alzheimer's patients, you know, through the middle stages of the disease. They can, they can still work harder and, and, and remember something if they, if they really work at it, but eventually they're going to lose that as well. Um, I can, I'm trying to if I can get out of this, uh, out to, out of these images I wanted to show you. I forgot to point out early on here in this MRI, the campus, in this normal individual, this kind of gray area. Oh, oh my pointer's not showing up, sorry. <laughs> so, right in there. It's just black hole over here. You know, it's just gone completely. Uh, Chris? Yeah, you mentioned the uh, the role of stress in um, autophagy and, and, mm. and the clearance of some of these things. Has inducing stress been explored as cruel as it might be as a, <laughs> a treatment for this? And and do people who you know do the ultra marathons and, and have stressful lives or, or and, Experience starvation have lower rates of Alzheimer's. Um, there's some evidence now coming from Europe um, where they're now experiencing a decline in dementia rates uh, that indicates that lifestyle makes a pretty big effect on total cases of dementia, but not Alzheimer's disease. It's kind of been disappointing, but um, it's still important to know that you know, 30 to 40 percent of cases of dementia we can affect through changing our cardiovascular um, lifestyle issues. And, you know, we could be wrong about the Alzheimer's, but maybe it's helping with Alzheimer's as well. Um, it's probably not going to help as much among those people that have ApoE4, and so there's actually some evidence for that. There's really good evidence in some animal models that it can improve cognition, especially late in life. Why is that? Well, the brain it uses about, throughout your whole day, about 30, 30 or 40% of your glucose goes to your brain. Uh, when you're sitting at rest and not moving your muscles and only using your brain, it's about 60% of your glucose is burning. Then could you substitute for the glucose? And ketones are one of those. So when you go into a ketogenic diet, your body makes these little short portions of a fat, essentially that float around in your bloodstream and, and can get right across the blood-brain barrier with no transporter. They just diffuse through the membranes of the cells. And um, so, you know, there's a hope there. Now, there have been some trials already done among people with mild cognitive impairment, and if they don't have an APOE4 meal, it helps them. Among all these interesting distinctions that suggest that maybe the disease process, of course, is maybe you don't change total calorie intake, but it's still stressful on the system to try to rob it of all the carbohydrates. You know, it's, a lot of people get grumpy when they're in a ketogenic <laughs> diet. Um, other kinds of stress, you know, um, I don't think there's been enough done yet with people who routinely reach that, uh, that, glyc that um, glycogen deficiency that you see in a marathon runner. It's kind of a special, I mean, I, you know, I do a lot of 10Ks, 5Ks. You know, I, my whole life I ran on some day. What you do is you reach this point where you're, you're, you're essentially depleting all of your musculature, all of its glycogen. And that's the real stress that would kick in the autophagy, invoking this mechanism and clearing protein aggregates. The caveat to that is that the brain really is pretty selfish and it controls responses to stress differently from the muscles. So in our animal models, sometimes we see that we can starve them for five hours 
and their muscle glycogen levels would drop severely, even their liver levels would drop as they consumed all that extra super storage in the form of starch in their muscles, and their brains are fine. Their brains are not experiencing any kind of drop in, in glucose um, because they have some special mechanisms to kind of send everything there. It's, it's really a precious organ that your body tries really hard just to supply and spare. So there's a potential out there that even if even among endurance athletes, um, they're invoking a stress in the muscles. It's not that stress is not being felt in the brain in the same way. Psychological stress is primarily um, adrenaline and uh, glucocorticoids. So a, there's a steroid hormone that's invoked when you're under psychological stress. That's that's a whole another interesting topic we could get into, but it. What it does is it has the ability, this is fascinating, has the ability to kill nerve cells in a specific part of the hippocampus to make room for new nerve cells that learn stuff much faster. So even people, probably starting to fade off a bit around age 50, somewhere in their 40s up to 50, we're not so good at this anymore, but we can actually regenerate new brain cells in our hippocampus. For sure, I mean, that's changed in a way that involves memory storage. And so there's this interesting hypothesis out there that we know that when you put an animal in a new situation, stress levels go up. They've got strangers they've got to become friends with, maybe some um, kind of threat of potential predators or whatever. They're learning something. It's, it's very stressful to them. Their glucocorticoids go up. It kills off. And we know exactly how, we know the mechanism by which the glucocorticoids kill these cells and they make room for new ones that are now much better at learning. So now they can learn this new mouse, learn this new corridor they have to, you know, crawl down. They can learn all this stuff much faster and easier. Okay, so what happens if they undergo something really, really traumatic and stressful? PTSD. They're in a war situation, they're raped, they're, they're held hostage. Something really traumatic happens. Your body is flooded with this glucocorticoid and it wipes out the hippocampus, almost kills the whole thing. Like it's, it's overreact, an over uh, abundance of this thing that was you know, originally an adaptive mechanism. And now they've got very little context under which to, to, um, to relate uh, new events in their day, their new environment, what's going on is threatening to them because they can't, can't really understand it because they're not able to, to uh, integrate it with, you know, against their old memory. They have all these symptoms and terrible psychological trauma related to the fact that their hippocampus has been wiped out and probably some other parts of the brain as well. But, so, so stress, you can, you know, a little bit of stress is a good thing and that, that's really analogous to exercise too, you know. You can exercise yourself to to death, the guy that was named now, you know, the, the guy that, that ran the first marathon. Cooper. See? Cooper? No, 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 this is an, an ancient Greek character that supposedly took the word of a, of a Greek victory to another town 26 miles away, and when he got there, he died. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can't remember his name, but uh, he ran two marathons. The town he ran to was marathon, I think, to report this, this victory. And, um, you know, he wasn't prepared for it. He, was, he, was, he over-exercised. But we know now, you know, plenty of people can go out and train for it. So a little bit of exercise is good for a little bit of stress. It helps our body respond in a homeopathic way and, and, and adapt, but you can have too much of a, of a thing like that. Um, and it looks like, you know, the glucocorticoids that, are, that surge from psychological stress can be one of those things that you can just have an overwhelming amount of that creates big, big problems. So, yeah, I mean, very, very good questions, and this is kind of, we, there are people, you know, working on that kind of thing, uh, trying to translate what we're seeing in animals into some human situations and find out if that could help. There's somebody back here with their hand up that, in the back row there was, yeah, just, we'll get back to you, Ann, but she didn't. Is there any time to... Uh, physical conditions come before memory loss, weakness, or not being able to understand words before the memory. Not, not really. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, motor function really isn't associated. 
So movements and stuff don't need, except in Louis Bobby dementia, most people are having some tremors and, you know, that's, that could become only Parkinson's disease, but it could become Louis Bobby where they have some problems. But, um, but for Alzheimer's and other kinds of pure dementias, um, we don't really see movement disorders participating. But there is uh, usually a phase that people go through that we call mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. And uh, this is actually more common than Alzheimer's itself. And about 50% of cases will just kind of stay with mild cognitive impairment, and about 50% will continue to progress to Alzheimer's. Mild cognitive impairment has a few manifestations, but one of the most common ones is difficulty in word finding. So we all experience a little bit of this as we get older, but there's a, there's a whole new level at which people you know, lose the word for the color of my car is. It's that bright one that's kind of red. Yeah, red, red. That's, you know, a word like that, you just wouldn't think you could ever forget that, but people do, and and that kind of thing um, factors into you know this symptomology we call mild cognitive impairment. And um, if you know someone who's experiencing that, it's really good to you know take them and get them checked out because it could be something that's really treatable. Um, but again, about five, about 50% of those patients will probably progress on to kind of Alzheimer's. Sure. From me or, or to UAMS or where? Yeah, right there. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, most GPs can, can recognize, they see it a lot, you know, so they, they can recognize uh, dementia. They're, they're really not trained at distinguishing Alzheimer's from other kinds of dementia. So, but if, you know, if you go to them and they tell you, look, this is not normal, then they could probably make you an appointment with somebody, you know, that could tell you whether this is something to worry consult your GP with first. Ann, did you have another question? I've got a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> 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 I, I think some, this I, man maybe some time at pint night. I, I'm surprised that Vern didn't ask me about alcohol consumption. <laughs> <laughs> Where is he going around? <laughs> okay. especially from a biochemical standpoint. But it's, it's something I've, I've become to worry about a little bit more now that chronic wasting disease is in a deer population. I guess. The way the <laughs> was handled it has caused my brother to stop hunting deer. Yeah, he, him, huh? Well, he, he sent a buck's head in to be examined and had no chronic wasting disease. And he's thinking if they examine it and can't figure out that it's as old as it really is, they may not be able to figure out if he's got chronic wasting disease either. Maybe they mixed up some, maybe they mixed up some records there. They may have mixed up and transmitted to a human. It's in, and we, we do know, in the laboratory, we do experiments that show that it's really quite different from, uh, um, there's even some differences between European deer and American deer in their ability to transmit it to cows. Um, so, so all these prion diseases have these really interesting species barriers where, um, like you try to go from mouse to sheep, or sheep to cow, or cow to mouse, um, there's usually a lag, and then you take that same individual, say you took it from a cow to a mouse, you can take that mouse material, put it in another mouse, and it goes like that. Um, so there's something that happens when it crosses the species barrier that makes it much more facilitated to, you know, for transmission among that species. Um, but right now it looks like going from deer to human is really, really difficult. And to do it in a laboratory, you have to really, really push it through ungodly, unnatural forms of, of cycling, of exposure over and over and over. Um, so there's a pretty good chance that we're never going to get it from deer. Uh, or if we do, we'll be 112, you know, before it happens. Um, but, but it's still, you know, this is one of those things where I, I used to take all the risks in my life based on the odds. 
And now I've kind of started to factor in mistakes. <laughs> you know? So this is something where the odds are really low, but the stakes are pretty terrible, you know. So I, I've decided not to eat venison myself for a while and see how this shakes out. Uh, we have one last question. Okay. You had mentioned uh, when Caucasians uh, have a higher uh, rate of Alzheimer's. Uh, what, can you well, they have, a, they have a higher response to that genetic difference in the ApoE4 or ApoE uh, gene. Um, so in overall rates, the, the levels go from African Americans to Hispanics to Caucasians. Um, you know, in this country. Asians really are quite mixed across the whole spectrum. But, um, so there are higher rates of dementia among um, African Americans, and, and, and that also holds for bona fide real Alzheimer's disease. But a smaller percentage of them get it from the ApoE4. Um, ApoE3 evolved in Europe. We, we were originally all, as humans, carrying the ApoE4 allele hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, ApoE3 came along in Europe. Um, there's, you still find ApoE4 more prevalent, um, certainly throughout Africa, but also uh, in the whole equatorial region of the world where um, in any place where food insecurity is a little bit more common. Um, so people that are more that have more history with famine, okay. for some reason, have very little ApoE3 and I think, honestly, it has something to do with this response to starvation um, that the cells undergo. Um, but there's some other theories about resistance to um, trypanosomes like, uh, like malaria and such. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a more recent evolutionary development to have the, the one that allows us to live longer uh, without dementia. And uh, what we think is that populations where ApoE4 is more common, like Africans, um, they have other changes in their genome that have compensated to some extent for that. So, so having the E4 doesn't affect them the same, to the same degree as it does people for whom it's kind of novel, <laughs> genetically. Okay, thanks so much. This has really been fun. Your questions were really great questions. We hope you've found today's uh, meeting thought-provoking and, I think, stimulating. Um, if you're glad that people in uh, Central Arkansas are organizing a secular community and working to improve the lives of free thinkers, please consider joining ASF by signing up at the back table or making a donation. There's a little teapot back there. You can tuck a couple dollars in. Uh, even more. You can tuck quite a few dollars in that. Um, <laughs> So stick around, hopefully. Uh, most of, I see mostly friendly faces I've seen before, but if, if you're new, please stick around for a few minutes. Um, another way that you can meet new friends and get involved in our community is by, and in your community, is by attending other events that we put on and joining volunteers and hosting events. Um, I'm just looking at our meetup calendar right now. We have... Uh, Coming up, we have this Thursday, Beyond Belief, it's a Secular Substance Abuse Recovery. It's an online event, if you go to, um, and you can get to our calendar from there, our event calendar, and you can see all of these things. So this next Sunday, we have something new called Supper of Sacrilege. Um, that is gonna be at TGI Fridays at 6 p.m., the one in Lakewood Village, I think. Okay. And uh, the night after that, Monday, we will have a Zoom night where we kind of do this online. Um, and then there are other things we um, are involved with and like to go to from the Central Arkansas Library System. Uh, Wednesday, next Wednesday at 6, is Socrates Cafe at the Fletcher Library. Um, a lot of these things happen weekly, bi-weekly, so you just have to go out. But we've got Socrates Cafe at Maumel, another first Tuesday. Uh, we have pizza night. Is it the first Tuesday the pizza night thing? First Tuesday of the month. First Tuesday of the month. And, and tomorrow, you just got put back on the calendar. Tomorrow, it's uh, flying saucer at 7. It's prime night.
go to Meetup and check those things out. Um, there's some brochures at the back table. If you'd like to host an event, such as a potluck or a protest or a rally, or any other kind of activism event, or you know a young person or an old person or anybody who is interested in doing that or working with other organizations like us who are interested in activism, events like that. You know, there are a lot of great um, new act activism groups that have just popped up over several of the things that happened in the legislative session this year. And so um, we're hoping to have some of them in to describe their group so that we can learn how to work together to collaborate and pool our resources. So we're really excited about that. And so if you hear of a group like that, go ahead and talk to them and say, hey, we've got a group that we'd love for you to come in and uh, you know, give you the podium for a while and let you share so that we can see how to support you and your work as well. Um, if you'd like to be considered as a speaker uh, or you know someone who might be, let us just talk to me afterwards or uh, any of the board uh, members. We also have a need for people who can help us by contributing their skills in graphic design or web development or legal issues or PR. Um, anybody out there who's got great PR marketing skills, who has some ideas of how we can use our social media and things to get the word out, um, we'd be interested in, in your support as well. Um, in May, our program will be a rundown of the Arkansas Legislative Session that I refer to as the Arkansas Legislative Session of 2023, matching almost the 2021. Uh, to give us the breakdown, Arkansas AC, our speaker. Uh, she's also my brilliant wife. And if you don't attend, I'm legally obligated to locate and confiscate all of your guns. <laughs> That's not an ACLU thing. That was just in our marriage contract. Um, so <laughs> one of the key functions of ASF is to help free thinkers make friends and connections. And we hope you'll stick around for a few minutes after today's meeting to do just that. And then tell someone else you know about ASF and bring them with you next month so we can see some new faces and fill the rest of our chairs. So thank you for coming. We'll see you next month. human beings and are never threatened with eternal damnation. In a nutshell, a free thinker believes there are no imaginary gods whose dogmas is sent to control the human race. Rather, we are all human beings responsible for our own actions and our own future. Check us out at any of the following online locations. Send us an email and let's talk. Or go to Meetup and join us at any of our regularly scheduled events. Let's get together and hope to see you soon. If you'd like to know more about the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers, check us out online at arfreethinkers.org. You can also find us on Meetup, Facebook, and on YouTube. At Arkansas Society of Freethinkers, people are accepted as human beings and are never threatened with eternal damnation. In a nutshell, a freethinker believes there are no imaginary gods whose dogma is sent to control the human race. Rather, we are all human beings responsible for our own actions and our own future. Check us out at any of the following online locations. Send us an email and let's talk. Or go to Meetup and join us at any of our regularly scheduled events. Let's get together and hope to see you soon.
were threatened with eternal damnation. In a nutshell, a free thinker believes there are no imaginary gods whose dogmas is sent to control the human race. Rather, we are all human beings responsible for our own actions and our own future. Check us out at any of the following online locations. Send us an email and let's talk. Or go to Meetup and join us at any of our regularly scheduled events. Let's get together and hope to see you soon. If you'd like to know more about the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers, check us out online at arfreethinkers.org. You can also find us on Meetup, Facebook, and on YouTube. At Arkansas Society of Freethinkers, people are excited. Tell me about your culture. 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 Tell me about so this is where, evidently, where, let me, let me check over here real quick. It just sounded like, let me hear, let me have that. Okay, test, testing, testing. All right. Camera. Camera one, camera one. Okay. All right. Scratch that one up there. Okay. Testing. One, two, three. I have no clue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. We shut it down. All right. Yeah, let me uh, show how we're doing this.